Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, so we are finishing up the semester with urinary tract disorders. Uh, this PowerPoint is specifically going to be over, I think, was it incontinence? Yes, incontinence. Um, and then we'll have one on urinary retention. I'll have one on Foley catheters, um, urinary diversions, and then there's the three major urinary disorders that you want to be familiar with, which are UTIs, um, kidney stones, and then uh, BPH. So those are going to be your urinary tract disorders. So um, let's dive right in. I'll warn you, of course, it's the end of the semester. So I have come down with the, I've talked too much and I have nasal drainage. So if I have to possibly pause to blow my nose, forgive me. So um, urinary incontinence. So this is something that might seem like a rather simple concept, but believe it or not, there's actually a lot more to it because um, always there is with nursing school. Um, so urinary incontin incontinence is just like fecal incontinence, um, except of course they're urinating on themselves. It's like they may not know when they need to go or they may have the inability to hold it in. Um, again, kind of think like a weak muscle or weak sphincter that leads it where they're harder to um, or have difficulty holding um, uh, their urination in. Sometimes also it's a functional thing where they have a mental status or physical limitation, mobility limitation that might pre prevent them from getting to the bathroom on time. So in other words, they might know they need to go and they might even try to get there, but maybe due to their physical abilities um, or um, uh, their, um, just the, what they have available, uh, an available bathroom, it may prevent them from being able to be continent. Uh, some disease processes that are associated with urinary incontinence are things like obesity. When there's more intra-abdominal pressure, it's going to put pressure on those organs, um, BPH, uh, recurrent urinary tract infections as well. And then um, there's also confusion. Um, you know, mental status changes uh, can really lead to a lot of incontinence issues. Again, mobility, unable to get out of the bed. A history of urinary surgeries, um, and then also, of course, medications that cause frequent urination, like some cardiac ones, like furosemide. <sighs> so much fun. Um, so there's more than one way to be incontinent, and of course, there's categories uh, when it comes to incontinence. Um, the big ones that we usually talk about are going to be things like uh, stress incontinence. Um, you'll hear a lot or see a lot of, especially women with what's called an overactive bladder or urge incontinence. And then, like I said, a lot of times it's a functional issue. But the reason that we really want to know these categories is not to drive you nuts. It's because um, depending on the cause of the incontinence or the type of incontinence, there's going to be different treatments that are appropriate for the patient. So to kind of break these down, Starting with stress incontinence, this is a weak muscle issue. You know, I have a sphincter, so this is kind of the same like GERD, but in your urinary tract where you have a sphincter that's supposed to stay closed. But if it gets weak, then when you cough, you laugh, you sneeze, um, you lift something heavy, um, it, it leads for an opportunity for urine to slip out, which leads to that incontinence. Um, for urge incontinence, think urgency. So this is a person who has an overactive bladder. Um, the bladder doesn't need to go all the time, but it feels this constant need to be like, oh my God, I need to go. Oh my God, I need to go. And so it leads to incontinence that way. So like a lot of times stuff slips out. Then um, there's overflow incontinence. This is the opposite of stress where there's a weak muscle where sometimes with overflow, it can actually be like the muscle is too closed not always, but sometimes the muscle is too closed um, or the bladder just gets too full. And what happens is think of it like a glass of water. If you had a, maybe I have a glass of water here. Let's say I have a, let's see if I can put it here, cup of water. If this was filled to the top and I kept pouring more on, what happens? Eventually it overflows. And the same happens with your bladder um, for when, um, uh, yeah, if you have overflow incontinence is that eventually the bladder gets so full that then some urine starts to uh, slip out. There's also um, reflex incontinence. And with reflex incontinence, this is like the a loss of, of the spine's ability to send a message to tell your um, body to either stay closed or to empty. Um, but it's loss of the reflex message to tell you to urinate. So um, a lot of times there's no warning or stress that's applied here. It's just like, boom, you know, just urination. And so this happens often with spinal injuries where they no longer have the ability to keep that muscle closed um, because they don't have that spinal reflex. 
Um, then we talked about functional, but um, this is like mental status issues, lack of mobility or lack of access. Um, so think environment or losses of loss of ability to get to the bathroom in time. All right, so let's uh, let's do a practice question. Uh, a client is admitted with a urinary tract infection. I know we haven't talked about those yet, but don't worry. You know, anytime you see a question, like especially if you're on your HESI and you're like, ooh, like we they told me that I, there wouldn't be anything on here that I haven't covered yet. Um, but if you see something, remember the question might not be about what you think it is. So read the whole question before you freak out. Um, and I'm not saying freak out anyway, you should probably stay chill, but <laughs> you get the point. Um, so a client submitted with a UTI and has been intermittently incontinent. Which assessment finding would indicate the client is experiencing a complication of their incontinence? So this is this is not asking anything about the urinary tract infection. It's actually asking how do I know that there um, there's some sort of complication of their incontinence? Um, okay. So, um, the client complains they were having burning. Uh, client complains they were having burning when they urinate. Well, this sounds like a sign of a UTI, but not necessarily a sign anything to do with their incontinence. I would expect that. Client's urine is yellow, cloudy, and has sediment. That's again, a sign of a problem with their UTI, but not necessarily a sign of um, a problem with uh, their incontinence. Like incontinence itself um, doesn't usually change the color of your urine. Um, client has some mild redness and excoriation in their perineal area. Now, this is something that's different. You know, with UTIs, it's not expected to have skin issues, but with incontinence, um, they can start to have skin issues, which can be a sign of a complication. So this is the answer I like the best so far. The last one is client's GCS was 15 and now their current score is a 13. Well, this is something else that I definitely find concerning. A change in G GCS could be a sign of worsening infection and stuff like that, but I don't think it's related to their incontinence. Um, so like, in other words, what this question is really asking is which of these is one, a problem, and then two is a problem directly related to incontinence. A, B, and D seem like answer choices that are related to complications in general with this patient, but C is the only one that's related specifically to the incontinence. In other words, incontinence doesn't shouldn't cause burning. They shouldn't cause change in their urine and it shouldn't cause a change in mental status. But all of these factors, of course, do have to do with a UTI or worsening there. So um, anyway, um, C is the best answer here. So I'm expecting for a patient with urinary incontinence to have leakage of their urine, uh, inability of the recognize inability to recognize the need to go, inability to get to the restroom in time, and time um, skin breakdown in perineal area. And I know that I said like it was a complication, but even though like what I'm saying here expected, it doesn't mean that it's okay. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that it's not a sign of a problem. Um, and then um, wet linens or bed. Um, is going to be another expected finding. I'm going to ask them about any issues they might have with urination, like what, is their pa what are their patterns, um, how often do they go, do they know if they need to go, and then um, of course a, uh, I'm going to look for infection because sometimes incontinence is caused by infection. So like that patient in the last question, you know, it seems like the incontinence, I mean, it may have just been something they've always had, but it could have been the result of the UTI they have. Um, we're going to talk about this when we get to UTIs, but a lot of times older adults, they present with change in level of consciousness. Um, of course, the urinary symptoms, um, but um, they can also like when they have infection, sometimes they have abnormal or other symptoms. Um, but this incontinence could be just a result of um, an infection. So it's something that we can fix or work on. So we definitely want to check and make sure there is no infection. Now, incontinence itself doesn't usually cause um, infection on its own, but um, uh, infection can definitely cause urinary incontinence. Um, it depends, of course, on the type of um, incontinence. Like we said, there's the different categories because it is always possible, but usually um, the infection comes first and then the incontinence. So 
um, diagnostic testing that we're going to do for this patient is um, looking for, um, you know, any sort of problems, like looking, doing a pelvic exam, um, ruling out infection or other causes, like we talked about doing a urinalysis, and then um, seeing if they're retaining urine, because um, this is also going to put them at a higher risk for um, infection things, but it helps us to narrow the cause. Because um, like, you know, for example, if they have that overflow incontinence, where they're just getting full, and then empty, um, then like slowly dribbling out, then we're going to like a assess um, with a bladder scanner and see like a very full bladder. Um, so like when people go to the bathroom, they should pee and they should empty majority of their bladder. I think like, a, I want to say your book says like less than 50 is normal or something like that. Um, and then 50 to hundred is like, or maybe like anywhere from like like 100 to 200 is considered like we need to take a look at it. And then greater than 200 is considered abnormal. Um, but um, we want to see, uh, you know, what's going on inside their bladder. Are they emptying properly? Because this can help to identify what the problem is. Because again, we always have to figure out what the issue is um, to get to the bottom of how we can help this person. I mean, I guess I will say this because I mean, every time I say a statement, then I'm always like, well, <laughs> this is what I hate about nursing school. Um, it's so hard to teach sometimes. So the one thing I will say about infection and um, incontinence is, is that um, if someone's incontinent and they're sitting in their, you know, urine or whatever else they're sitting in for a period of time, they will be at higher risk for infection. So it's possible that in um, incontinence could cause infection. Um, you know, but um, usually infection comes first. Um, it just kind of depends on the patient. And then uh, we're going to talk more about this concept real quick, but um, PVR is what's known as a post void residual. So that what I was talking about here is, is we scan their bladder. So this is like an ultrasound of the bladder. Techs um, and um, nurses can do this, depending like not every facility techs might not be checked off on it, but some uh, most that I've worked at, they are. Um, and what they do is it's it does a little ultrasound of the bladder and tells you what the volume in the bladder is. And so we what we like to do is we like to do this after they pee to see what's left after they pee. And again, usually it should be zero. Zero. Um, but if they're retaining stuff, it would help me to uh, tell what um, type of incontinence that they have. So, of course, urinary incontinence is better if there's little or no episodes of incontinence. The skin is clean, dry, and intact. It's worse if there's more continued episodes or signs of um, skin breakdown, signs of infection, um, like a UTI. Or if they have a UTI and it's getting worse. Um, so treatments, again, depends on the cause for stress incontinence. This is a muscle issue. So what we're going to teach them to do is kegels. And kegels are where you um, are working your pelvic floor. It's an internal muscle that you're stretching. So it's not one that, you know, if you're doing your kegels right now and you were sitting in front of me, I hopefully shouldn't be able to tell. Otherwise, you're being a little weird about it. Um, but, um, you, uh, pretty much are going to be like most people when they practice them, they just tighten and loosen, tighten and loosen. And it just helps to work on those sphincters to keep those sphincters closed. Um, for urge incontinence, this is where they have, um, you know, too much of an urge to go. It's that like, oh my God, I gotta go. Oh my God, I gotta go over and over and over again. Um, so we need to do things to decrease the urge. Usually these patients need medications. This is like the overactive bladder. So the most common medications you're going to see, um, the one I see given the most often is an anti anticholinergic known as oxybutynin. Um, and of course, it's anticholinergic. So we worry about it drying out too many other things. Um, you know, it can end up causing urinary retention, blurred vision, things like that. So we want to keep a close eye on that. Um, for overflow incontinence, again, this is the one where it's overfilled. Um, if the prostate is a problem, we may need to, cause like sometimes what happens is, is that the bladder can't empty or the bladder is filling up too much because there's an obstruction. So if that obstruction is the prostate, we'll talk more about these, um, uh, these two meds when we talk about prostate issues, but we can give them, um, finasteride, which shrinks the prostate, or we also can give them, um, something to relax their sphincter. And this is whether they're, um, so the, uh, the finasteride is only for males, but the, um, tamsolacin just relaxes your sphincter and allows, um, for easier voiding. It relaxes the smooth muscle in your urinary tract to make it easier to void. Um, so if there's, you know, something going on for someone who's male or female, um, this medication can help as well. One moment. Sorry about that. Apparently I'm having overflow incontinence of my nasal passages. So uh, I apologize for that. Anyway, 
Um, getting on to reflex. And so if for overflow, we're going to do things to allow for ease or for it to um, more easily flow. Um, so getting rid of the obstruction or allowing for the smooth muscles to be more relaxed. There's reflex incontinence. Um, for this, this is a spinal issue. Most of the time we need self-catheterization, things like that. Um, it just depends on the patient. Sometimes we have to find alternatives because it's like a spinal thing. We, and if they have a spinal injury that can't be corrected, a lot of times we just have to look for alternatives like, you know, timed voiding and stuff like that. Um, then functional, we want to modify their environment. So is there something getting in the way? Do they have the equipment that they need to um, use the restroom, like a bedside commode handy or a bathroom that they can easily access? If it's mobility, having the right equipment or right number of help uh, helpers or people to help them. And then also avoiding schedule, because sometimes if it's a mental thing where they um, maybe don't have the ability to know when they need to go, just taking them to the bathroom every few hours can work. There are surgical options. You don't have to know those in depth, but just know there's things depending on the type to help strengthen change, reinforce muscles, reconstruct things, that kind of stuff. Um, and if they are obese or overweight, we do want to encourage weight loss. Um, the nursing focus for urinary incontinence is going to be to reminding them to do their kegels, um, timed voiding, you know, just always thinking like, you know, this patient may not be able to think about or remember to go to the bathroom. So you want to be their brain um, and remind them or give them opportunities to go. Um, a good routine for their bladder is helpful, but also for their bowels, because a lot of times people don't consider this. Um, but if you have a lot of stool in your rectum um, or in your, um, you know, things are starting to back up, it actually puts pressure on your urinary tract, which can um, increase the risk of urinary incontinence. So we want to have the bowels cleaned out, you know, not regularly holding on to things regularly, um, uh, defecating or going to the bathroom, pooping. Also, we want to avoid urinary irritants. So remember there's GI irritants, spicy fatty acidic, then our urinary irritants are gonna be things like caffeine, um, artificial sweeteners, citrus juices, alcohol, and cigarettes. There's gonna be more, I think chocolates in there too, of course, and um, yeah, all the good stuff. So um, definitely just wanna keep this in mind, teaching them to avoid those, cause it can make it, um, it can increase their frequency of their urination, irritate their tract. Um, and then we want to protect the skin doing things like incontinence collectors um, to regularly uh, try to keep their skin as dry as possible if we cannot avoid incontinence, regular skin assessments, applying barrier cream and barrier cream is like a thick cream that um, prevents this, like even if the skin gets wet, um, it prevents um, the caustic effect. So it's kind of literally like the name suggests, it stands as a barrier between the, um, the urine and the skin. And then frequent repositioning as well. All right, so um, there's definitely pros and cons um, for incontinence collectors. You want to think that there is, um, you know, of course, it's hard sometimes when someone's urinating on themselves. We don't, uh, we, you know, we used to put diapers on a lot of patients. We've really moved away from that because it keeps things really close to them, increases their risk of infection, um, and also can increase their risk of skin problems. So there's lots of um, interesting and different devices out there these days. Um, a lot of times we just use like these blue pads or chucks and then change them frequently. And then for men, there are condom caths, which, um, allow it works kind of like a Foley, except it's an external catheter. Um, there are considerations here. One, you still need to change this regularly, good care. And then a lot of people don't know how to apply them. Sometimes people pull the foreskin back and it ends up, it can cause um, really bad um, skin issues. And then if it's not cleaned well, cause I mean, they're still like, even if they're peeing down into the tube, there's still some moisture that's getting around the tip of their penis. It can cause pressure, breakdown, things like that. And just regularly checking it. I had a patient not too long ago. And I think that just chronically had these condom catheters and I went to change it. You know, I was doing my um, care, you know, and he was circumcised. So I was pulling back the foreskin to clean underneath and it was just covered with fungus, like no joke. And, um, so something to kind of keep in mind is, is that um, you always want to clean the skin around and then make sure you're applying in a way again. If they have foreskin, you're supposed to apply it over. You're not supposed to retract and pull back their foreskin and keep it retracted. Um, and then you want to clean underneath that skin for sure. Um, there's something else I was going to say about condom catheters. 
Did I, oh yeah. And then um, a lot of times to allow them to, you want to get the right size. So it's a good thing to get in report is like what size condom cath are they so that you're not like wasting a bunch or just trial and error. And then um, you want to, a lot of times we put like an adhesive um, uh, sticky stuff around on the outside when we're applying it to get a good fit. Just know that these can like um, these can like bust off if someone has very powerful urination, which happens sometimes. Um, so yeah, just kind of keeping a close eye. Um, then for females, commonly what we use now is what's called the pure wick. And so this is like an external catheter for females. Um, this part goes in between the lips and it should be secured in there where it can, I mean, you want to have it far down enough into the patient, not into the patient, um, you know, on the patient. Uh, definitely don't stick it inside, please, Jesus. <laughs> we kind of, uh, but um, you want to stick it down far enough, uh, we call it in their perineal area that it can actually um, soak stuff up because most people, um, for females, when we pee, stuff kind of goes down. Um, so what happens here, this is attached to a continuous suction. And when they pee, it goes through this white pad and then gets sucked up by the suction um, and um, hopefully goes into a canister to measure and also just to keep an eye. But these are imperfect systems. Most of them leak or it's hard to get the perfect suction or, you know, some slips around. So just keeping a close eye on their skin, monitoring for... Um, uh, what do you call them? The cleanliness of this. I mean, this is not, these are meant to be changed every 12 hours or, or more often if needed. I'm just keeping a close eye because this is in like direct contact with their skin. Um, so just kind of keeping an eye on that. Now, sometimes people want to use these for convenience because they just don't feel like getting up and peeing, but you always want to encourage your patients to be continent where they can. Um, you know, as much as sometimes it just seems like the easy route just to be like, hey, whatever. Yeah, just do this um, or just pee on yourself. Like if we can do something to facilitate them going in a bedpan, something else, bedside commode. And um, we always want to try to encourage that because that's going to decrease their chance of complication or other issues. All right. That's it for urinary incontinence. Oh, and by the way, I'll say this. Um, we caught, um, if this wasn't a online professional video, um, I would tell you more stories about all the names people call the pure wicks, but just be ready. Those um, external female catheters, there are some funny names for them. Um, just get ready and just know that like when people are saying a really strange name or making an inappropriate slander, they're probably talking about the pure wick. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, um, lots of fun being a nurse. See you for urinary retention next.